For more physics-related content, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 3F. In this video, I will go over energy instability in general relativity. I will first cover how binding energy is defined in GR. Then I'll derive the post-Newtonian correction to the binding energy. And then I'll briefly go over stability. I've rated the physics level in this video as advanced. To start off, let's review the difference between rest mass and gravitational mass. I covered this in Stellar Physics 3C when I derived the TOV equation, so I'm just going to review it briefly. We've assumed the spherically symmetric and static geometry, so we have a Schwarzschild type metric, where these functions in the metric, e to the nu and e to the lambda, are only functions of r, which is the radial position. And what's important here, the proper length, which corresponds to locally measured distances, which I'm denoting as r0, is not equal to the coordinate length, r. And this is what we mean when we say we have a curved spacetime. So here I wrote that the r coordinate has curvature. Probably a more accurate way of saying it is that the r coordinate does not account for curvature, which is what we experience as gravity. The consequence of this is that if we have a star and we look at some radial position inside it, and let's say that radial position encloses some mass m of r, the radial position r does not equal the proper distance, meaning the locally measured distance, and the mass enclosed is not equal to the proper mass enclosed. So we have a distinction between the gravitational mass and the proper mass. The gravitational mass is defined as the total mass energy content. So mathematically, this will be the energy density integrated over the coordinate volume, where epsilon here accounts for the internal energy. The reason I'm calling this the gravitational mass is because it's what shows up in the metric, and we found this in Stellar Physics 3C. And this is the mass that is responsible for spacetime curvature and can be measured by looking at orbiting objects. The rest mass enclosed will be the total rest mass density integrated over proper volume. So because spacetime is curved, we have to include this function e to the lambda to ensure that we're adding up locally measured distances. And we don't include the internal energy because that's not part of the rest mass. This mass is interpreted as counting up all the particles in a star and multiplying by their rest mass. What's important about the rest mass is that even though it's a straightforward concept, there is no experiment that can measure it. And finally, recall that when we derived the TOV equation, we found that this function e to the lambda is the inverse of 1 minus the metric deviation. Okay, so now let's move on to the binding energy. We define the binding energy as the difference between the gravitational mass and the rest mass. And another thing that's important here is that this quantity, the total baryon rest mass, is an invariant to all observers. If one observer counts 100 protons, everyone else has to count 100 protons. This is not like length and time, which differ from one observer to another. I can write the binding energy as a volumetric integral, or as an integral over gravitational mass, where here rho naught is the rest mass energy density, so m naught c squared divided by volume, and in the second integral, I've rewritten it as an integral over gravitational mass energy content. And recall that we know what e to the lambda is, or this mass is the gravitational mass. The thermal energy will depend on the exact state of the star, but we know what its general form is, where gamma 1 is the adiabatic index. In the case of radiation, it's 4 thirds. In the case of gas, it's 5 thirds. I showed this in the previous video, Stellar Physics 3E. Because proper quantities are invariant to all observers, it's convenient to write these integrals in terms of the proper volume and the proper mass, or rest mass. So this is the most general form of the binding energy in general relativity. Now, good luck integrating this. You first need to know something about the equation of state of the matter, but in general, these integrals cannot be solved analytically. Mainly because this mass here is the gravitational mass which is, in fact, this entire integral. So the integral that gives you the gravitational mass includes the gravitational mass in the integrand. So we can't really go any further. If you're finding this video interesting so far, be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. What we're going to do now is find the post-Newtonian correction in the weak field limit, meaning we want the first order GR correction beyond Newtonian gravity. So in this case, we're going to write the energy as the Newtonian energy 
plus a correction due to GR. This will only be applicable to a radiation equation of state, where the total energy is close to zero. In this case, the internal energy will have to be broken up into a first order term plus a correction. To simplify things mathematically a bit, I'm going to define beta of r as the metric deviation. And I'm going to assume that epsilon and beta are both small terms. I can then expand the energy to second order terms in epsilon and beta and drop all third order terms, leaving me with the following expression for the total energy. Now, naively, you might look at this and say, well, these two terms are first order, so that's the Newtonian energy, and then these two terms are the correction from GR. But we don't actually know that, and this is where it gets a little complicated. But you're going to see what I mean here in a minute. Let's first write the Newtonian energy in terms of a Newtonian mass and a Newtonian distance. In this case, what I've called beta, the metric deviation, may not be equal to the Newtonian beta. And we're going to define the GR correction to be the difference between this energy we just found and the Newtonian energy, which is in terms of Newtonian quantities. So now we have to figure out what are the Newtonian values. Basically, what we're asking is, what is beta Newtonian? The problem is there's an ambiguity here. Does the Newtonian mass correspond to the rest mass or the gravitational mass? In Newtonian theory, there is no distinction between the two. And what about the radial position? Is that proper length, or is it the coordinate length? Or is it something else altogether? So, you can see there's an ambiguity here. We don't know which one to pick, and there isn't really a good answer. Now, I'm going to show you the argument that is typically in textbooks, which is sort of the conventional way of doing this. But while I understand these arguments, I'm not fully convinced by them. So here's how they answer this question. The rest mass is invariant to all observers. This is because all you're doing is adding up all of the particles and multiplying by the rest mass. Well, in Newtonian theory, that's what you think you're doing, because there is no other way to define mass. So m Newtonian must be the rest mass, which means that these two epsilon terms, this one and this one, are equal since they're both being integrated over rest mass. So they cancel out. Now, you can see that this is a theorist's argument, because an experimentalist might say, well, maybe the Newtonian physicist thinks he's doing that, but when he's measuring things, he's actually measuring gravitational mass. He thinks he's measuring rest mass, but the mass that actually determines orbits is the gravitational mass. I could see how both arguments hold. Now, personally, I would go with the experimentalist because at the end of the day, it's what you measure that counts, and the rest mass would be the measured gravitational mass plus the binding energy. The fact that the Newtonian physicist is mistaken about what he's measuring doesn't change the fact that the mass that shows up in Newton's theory experimentally is the gravitational mass. But the textbooks do it this way, so we're going to go with what the textbooks say. Now, what about the radial position? The conventional argument here is that the rest mass density is just the locally measured density, and that's the same for everyone. It's the number of particles per unit local volume. And the total mass is also invariant. That's just the total number of particles times the rest mass. Therefore, what we have to take is the locally measured volume. And that's what we have to use to determine the Newtonian radial position. And you're going to see in a second that this does not equal the proper length. So we can expand the proper volume to first order in beta. And this will give us that the proper volume is equal to the coordinate volume plus a little piece. And now we say that this is equal to 4 pi over 3 times the Newtonian radius cubed. Taking the cube root of this volume gives us our Newtonian in terms of the radial coordinate plus a little piece. And notice that this is not equal to the first order expansion of the proper length, although the difference will be relatively small. Now, I don't know if you're convinced by this argument. I understand it, but as I said, it's ambiguous. We have no way of knowing for sure which quantities in GR correspond to the quantities in Newtonian gravity. 
So really, the argument for these quantities are as good as any other one. Okay, now we have all the Newtonian quantities, and we just have to substitute them in to our post-Newtonian correction. Now these two terms are already second order, because we have an epsilon and a beta, both are small, and this is beta squared. But these two terms are first order, and what's going to be the second order term is the difference between the two, which I'm going to call delta beta. So let's figure out what this is. Negative beta over 2 is just gm over rc squared. And I'm going to write m, which is the gravitational mass, in terms of an integral over the proper mass, the rest mass. I can expand this to first order, giving me that this gravitational mass is the proper mass plus a correction term. Now let's take a look at beta newton over 2. We've already determined that the Newtonian mass is the proper mass, so we can just plug that in right away. And we found an expression for the Newtonian position in terms of the coordinate r. And again, we just want to expand this to first order correction. And we have an expression for delta beta. Now notice these are going to be double integrals, because these are themselves integrals, and that all gets substituted into here, which is then integrated over the rest mass. Okay, let's continue on a different board and summarize what we just found. We have an expression for the GR correction, post-Newtonian correction, and we have this expression for delta beta. I can now plug in delta beta into our post-Newtonian correction, and I get this long expression with five different integrals. Now all of these terms are second order already. So any difference between the proper mass and the gravitational mass, or proper r and coordinate r, will be a third order correction. And we're dropping third order corrections. So I can rewrite all these integrals in terms of the gravitational mass and the coordinate position. Now you have to actually integrate this. We're going to integrate this over a polytrope profile, which we derived in Stellar Physics 3b. And I'm not going to actually do it. In the end, you have to do this numerically. And so finally, after all this work, <laughs> in the end, after integrating this, we get a final expression for the post-Newtonian correction, where k of n is a numerical factor resulting from the integral over the polytrope profile and will depend on which polytrope index you pick. So n is the polytrope index. In our case, we're going to pick n equals 3, that corresponds to radiation-dominated star, and that's the only time the post-Newtonian correction is actually relevant. m is the total mass of the star, meaning the total gravitational mass of the star, what you measure with the gravitational field, and rho sub c is the rest mass density at the center of the star, so the central density. Now let's take a look at the total binding energy and stability. Now the total energy is the Newtonian energy plus the GR correction, which we can plug in. We already found the Newtonian energy in the previous video. And gamma 1 is going to be very close to 4 thirds, since we only care about this for radiation-dominated environments. To find the equilibrium energy, just like we did in the previous video, Stellar Physics 3e, we want to minimize the energy. Anyways, we know it's going to be very close to zero because the Newtonian energy is zero and then plus a small correction due to GR. To find the conditions for stability, we do the same thing as we did in the previous video. We set the second derivative to be greater than zero. And when you do this, it turns out that the criteria for stability is that gamma one minus four thirds is greater than a term that's very close to the metric deviation. Now recall, gamma one tilde is the pressure average of gamma one. I explained this in the previous video that gamma 1 might not be the same everywhere in the star, so what really matters is not gamma 1, but this gamma 1 tilde quantity. This is when you account for the fact that gamma 1 may vary throughout the star. The critical mass, meaning when the star goes unstable, will basically be the mass corresponding to zero Newtonian energy. So that just means when these two terms are equal to one another, with gamma 1 equals 4 thirds, meaning this will be also rho sub c to the 1 third, just like in this term, so they'll cancel out. And for more detailed information, you need to expand gamma 1 as 4 thirds plus a little bit, meaning you're expanding the internal energy to be radiation, or 100% radiation dominated, plus a little bit due to gas pressure. 
So this term here is gamma 1 is equal to 4 thirds, and this delta E internal will be the correction due to the fact that gamma 1 is not quite 4 thirds. There's always some gas pressure. And what that is will depend on the exact equation of state of the star. We'll take a look at this in greater detail in a couple of videos when we discuss the GR instability. In the next video, I'm going to summarize everything we just learned about binding energy so that we can then apply this to various situations in stars, where we're going to find the binding energy of the sun, the maximum possible mass of a star, the maximum mass of a white dwarf, also called the Chandrasekhar limit, and we'll revisit the maximum mass of a neutron star. So if you're interested in these topics and you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when these videos are released.